Now, I'm not the biggest fan of Crocodile. Surprising, since this is now my second video acting as this man's defense attorney, but yeah, throughout the internet, I either see people love or hate this man, saying some combination of he was always weak, or he fell off, or he lost to the stretchy kid, he lost to old cancer man, he lost to frog hawk, either that or the constant spamming of Hisashi Buridana. But today, as neither a fan nor a hater, but someone who thinks this man is a solid 6.5 out of 10 character and barely scraping top 5 villains in the story, I'll be exploring everything we know about him from Alabasta to the current events of the story, and explaining why, first of all, he's not a fraud, he isn't weak, and most importantly, he's a really fun and interesting side character. First time we see him is in Little Garden, where he calls Mr. Prince and falls for his brilliant impersonation skills. Usually I'd take this chance to call Crocodile stupid, but have you seen Mr. 3? He's basically the biggest dumbass you'll ever meet, so it's not so far out of the realm of possibility to think he'd put on a stupid voice answering the phone. Anyways, Mr. Prince then pulls off his masterful maneuver, but then gets caught and has to beat up these animals in sunglasses. Then comes back with the excuse that one of the Straw Hats was alive, but now, yeah, now he really finished all of them off. And this makes Crocodile run out of patience, you know? There's only so much goofiness you can handle running a secret organization, and he's reached his limit. So he's like, alright buddy, stay safe. Then immediately turned around to Nico Robin and says, alright, kill this dude. Because even though Mr. Two's just as goofy, he can actually get the job done, and that's where Crocodile draws the line. The next time we see Crocodile, he's just got a flex on him, you know? He encounters just one of the most terrifying pirate captains on the Grand Line, but bro's chillin'. No reaction, handles business and gets the bag. Bro don't get paid for overtime, alright? In and out. Anyway, this is probably the point in time I should actually explain the plot. Basically, Croco Boy's plan is to use this substance called dance powder. It does some sciencey stuff, which Nami explains here if you want to pause, which I understand about as well as Zoro does, but anyway, in short, it makes it so wherever it's used, rain will start falling heavily, but to do that, it takes rain from surrounding areas. This caused so many problems that it literally started wars and was banned by the world government. Now Crocodile is using this powder to make it rain heavily in the capital of Alabasta, but the surrounding cities are in a constant drought in what's already a desert by the way. Maybe you can see the problem here. So Crocodile ends up framing the king of Alabasta, Cobra, for this, and that kicks off a huge rebellion. I'm talking a million people. Just chomping at the bit to overthrow the government, which, fair enough. It's not every day you have a mastermind like Crocodile that orchestrates all this. So the Straw Hats are the only ones that know the plan, right? And it's up to them to not only tell the king, but convince the entirety of Alabasta that the dude that constantly saves them from pirates is the bad guy, but the king that's been hogging all the rain is the good guy. So yeah, it's becoming pretty clear how absolutely and positively this man has the entire country under his thumb. Alright, quick recap done, back to it. Crocoboy calls a meeting and does an epic reveal, big smile on his face, you can tell he really loved this one. Anyways, he tells them the master plan and it's well thought out, high IQ, making use of their abilities to the best. He really didn't have to go that hard with it and he still would have won, but of course he wanted to flex as per usual. Oh yeah, I should also mention, on top of wanting to take over the country, his other goal was to find the location of Pluton, one of the three ancient weapons touted to have the power to destroy the entire world, and that was why he needed Nico Robin on his side too, because she was the only one capable of reading the Poneglyphs to get this info. So he gives his epic Bond villain speech, right, and he's confident since, you know, it's literally the perfect plan. Even having backups like the bomb set to auto detonate and him going the extra mile like disguising Mr. 2 as King Cobra and making him do diabolical things all over Alabasta, like there was no need to do that but bro just said why not. He's just the kind of guy that not only plays everything safe but also gets a kick out of outdoing his opponents on multiple different levels. Like if it wasn't for the Straw Hats, King Cobra would be his main opposition. And what did he do to this man? He convinced his whole country to hate him, with Cobra not even suspecting it was him, revealed it was him, which Cobra again, wouldn't have even known if the Straw Hats didn't tell him beforehand, imprisoned this dude in his own castle, lapped this dude again by impersonating him while he's imprisoned, like if this was a different type of story, this would be the ultimate revenge plot, like replace Vivi with Sasuke and Crocodile would be the main villain of the entire story. But of course, Mr. Stretchy pops in and ruins Croco Boy's fun, what can you do? We're not gonna retread old ground, I covered why Crocodile isn't weak for losing to Luffy in this video, which you can check out, but just a shortened version, Crocodile didn't lose, he didn't almost win, like aw, get him next time buddy, it was close, like you could say for other villains Luffy's beat. No, he did win, three times. Two of those times, Luffy was saved only because of Nico Robin, and only one of those times was after Crocodile backstabbed her. So fair enough, it's on him that Luffy lived through the last one, but he had no reason to doubt Luffy dying the first time. He was bleeding out, buried in the desert. A tried and true method for making sure someone don't come back. I mean, ask the cast of Breaking Bad. So yeah, unlucky buddy. Next time we see him is in the cover stories, where most of Baroque works is able to escape prison, but Crocodile and Mr. One are given the chance and decide to stay in prison, at which point, 
they're both transferred to impel down. Fair enough for Crocodile, I mean level 6 despite supposedly being the worst level is pretty chill, but for Mr. 1, bro was stuck doing hard labor in boiling hot conditions just cause he was a simp and just does whatever daddy Crocodile says. Like I don't feel bad for this man, he chose the simping path, so you can't really help a man that doesn't want to help himself. But before we move on to the aforementioned impel down, by the way shout out A, I, d I don't know why I picked this name, it's not even my favorite arc, <laughs> it's sad to say it's not even in my top 5 at this point, but it's too late to change it now. Anyways, let's get into Crocodile's childhood for a second. We don't know too much, so we gotta piece things together a little bit. All we really got is this picture from an SPS, and also the fact that at some point he decided chomping down on this thing was a good idea. I mean sure, you got devil fruit powers, but now your tongue doesn't work for like a year, so take your pick. And that's pretty much it. We don't know literally anything else about his childhood, except a certain potential event happening involving Ivankov, but even that's like 90% to have only happened when he was already an adult. So yeah, got no choice but to move on to his adult life. And here we got a tad bit more, not much, but we'll take what we can get. He, like many other great pirates that would define the next era, was present for Roger's execution, and though he doesn't show it, doesn't seem like the type, he was just as much of a dreamer and idealist as everyone else chasing the One Piece. As he's gotten older, he's gotten bitter over that topic for various reasons and chooses to go after more achievable goals. Granted, they still are ambitious, taking over a country and getting an ancient weapon would be insane feats to accomplish, but he very much thinks he's past the childish stage of chasing the One Piece, but in one cover story I didn't mention earlier, Miss Golden Week like uses paint or whatever, I don't know, on Crocodile to reveal his ideal clothing, and they're very clearly a Pirate King's jacket and hat. This dream is so repressed, but subconsciously Crocodile still has it, which is just precious, Lil Croco Boy is just like the dumbass rubber kid that beat him up after all. And keep all this in mind, cause we'll come back to it later. So going back to his early adulthood, the only real thing we know is that he was basically Moria, and I'm not talking Gecko Nikikado, alright, I'm talking prime, chiseled, Chad Moria that had a sizable New World level crew going after the One Piece, and to do that, battling an Emperor. For him, it was Kaido, for Crocodile, it was Whitebeard, and as strong as Kaido would become, he was nothing compared to a barely out of his prime Whitebeard at the time, and this madman Crocodile went for him instead. Of course, things didn't go well, he's in a delusional state about it later, acting like he barely lost, but his Whitebeard, taking someone's hand, which we assume is how Crocodile lost it, is already an insane punishment for him. He's not taking Crocodile's life, alright? He probably, no, definitely offered to take him on as his son. You know what, actually? You know how Kaido straight up killed Moria's whole crew, giving him lifelong PTSD? Maybe Whitebeard actually recruited Crocodile's old crew, giving him lifelong bitterness that this old man took all his buddies away after he got whooped. Alright, alright, my bias is showing. Whitebeard is in my top 5 characters. Crocodile would be lucky to break top 50, so I'm piling on him a bit. I gotta stop this. He's the main character of this video. But yeah, that's literally all we got. I do definitely think Oda's cooking more for his backstory later on. I mean, at least the Ivankov thing, right? And yeah, I know you're all desperate for it. No more stalling, let's get into Impel Down. So if we get in the mind of Crocodile, at this point, he's at his lowest. He's lost his entire empire that he spent, we can estimate, the better part of a decade building, along with any chance of him getting an ancient weapon, since not only did Robin not give him the info, he believed that it wasn't even on there. So he's in a similar state as post Alabaster Robin, where she believed she was at a dead end with no hopes of finding more Poneglyphs and more information. Same deal with Crocodile, he had no leads and no motivation to do anything. That's why he let himself get sent to Impel Down. In his twisted mind, Impel Down was probably the most interesting place he could be, surrounded by the most heinous criminals around and being treated in the same vein, bro probably would have been insulted if they put him anywhere higher than level 6, and there he stayed for months. I assume entertaining himself by hatching schemes to escape which he may or may not have eventually attempted, and probably also trying to manipulate the other inmates in various ways. After months of this, he finally found a reason to get out of bed, an opportunity to get revenge on Whitebeard who was on his way to fight a war at Marineford. So he decides to team up with his one time enemy Straw Hat Luffy who he doesn't seem to resent like he does Whitebeard. I assume cause he realizes his loss was pretty much a fluke slash insanely lucky, whereas with Whitebeard it's safe to say he got outclassed in every way, so he says he can help them escape, and this is where THE scene comes into play. As many theories have been made about this, the line itself is pretty short and very ambiguous. All Ivankov says is that he knows the weakness of crocodiles and he'll take him out if he betrays them. Now this can be taken two ways, either that Ivankov thinks he's a lot stronger than crocodile and can just take him out whenever he wants, and he's just using the secret as blackmail, or the secret is directly tied to Crocodile's power and he can use that to defeat him. Both are possible, but we all prefer the first one, let's be honest. It's a lot more spicy and we got a lot more to work with. So this one single line birthed the hellscape that is the Crocomom theory. I won't cover it much here because there have been about 18,000 YouTube shorts made about it already, but in short, people think 1. Crocodile used to be a woman and Ivankov turned him into a man, and then they extrapolate that, since Crocodile would have been a woman about the same age as Dragon, to think that they must have been together and he was Luffy's mom. 
That's it. That's the evidence. He was a woman. Woman equals able to give birth equals Luffy's mother. I mean, there's obviously more to it. I don't blame you if you buy into this theory because people can be very convincing. But <laughs> if Oda went this way, it would be funny. It would be it would be very Oda, but I just don't think he's going to go this way. So yeah, as you can tell, I don't believe in this theory, but I do think the first part is interesting about Crocodile potentially once being a woman. I mean, the pieces are all there. The groundwork is laid. Ivankov saying he knows a big secret, Crocodile not wanting it to come out, his face purposefully being hidden in the one flashback we have of him when he was younger, and him being gender ambiguous in the one image we have of him even younger, which most kids that age are, but still, it doesn't work against the theory. I'm good with this theory. It would add a lot of depth to his character. It would be an insane flashback to see the series of events leading up to it and following it and would overall be really fun and cool unless of course Oda pulls an Oda and makes the reason really tragic which he probably will but that would make it even better but of course this secret could also be an infinite amount of things just assuming it has to do with Ivankov's powers he has the hormone fruit he's able to manipulate any hormone in the human body maybe even things like age and I know Bonnie already has that fruit but it's not the first time we've seen fruits overlap so it's possible and as I said there's infinite possibilities beyond that any hormone you can think of, Ivankov can mess with it, and that's not even mentioning the fact that it doesn't even have to involve his fruit. It could be a whole separate secret, just something Ivankov may have seen or heard about Crocodile when he was younger. It could be literally anything, and when something has so many possibilities, ironically it gets harder to think of any that could actually work, so I'm not going to theorize on it, I'm just here for the ride and really interested to hear what the secret's about, no matter what it is. So the boys break out of Impel Down, we get some cold Crocodile panels out of it, so that's nice, and then we finally get the Marine Ford. This is the real turning point for Crocodile. It really took our biases away and let us see him for what he was more, since he now wasn't losing to the goofy kid we've been following, but instead clashing with the world's strongest swordsman and ruining Akainu and Sengoku's day. Crocodile shines so much in this arc, not enough to make it discredit Luffy's win over him, but enough to where it's a really cool background detail in the arc and makes you appreciate him more, and miss him more when he goes away again. From him challenging Whitebeard to saving Ace to saving Luffy and Jinbei, he might just be the MVP of this arc, all while not even trying to be. He didn't even want to help Luffy and Ace. He just did it to piss off the world government, which is just the level of petty that I am, so I support it. So after the war, Crocodile just pieces out into the new world with Daz Bones, and within two years, rebuilds his entire empire and then some. As far as we can tell from the very little we know about his business, at least one area of it is money lending, as we can see from him loaning Buggy the money he needed to start up his delivery service, and then later sinking an entire fleet of marine battleships just to get it back. While well, Buggy being Buggy somehow sweet talks his way out of being killed since he was flat broke at the time and couldn't pay Crocodile back, before then, and Crocodile called up Mihawk when the Warlord system was dissolved and suggested a partnership. Since the Marines were constantly showing up at Mihawk's island, being more annoying than an actual threat, but Mihawk likes his privacy so he quickly accepted Crocodile's offer, since in Crocodile's words, the Marines definitely wouldn't take an organization headed by the two of them lightly, except Crocodile would quickly find out it wouldn't be headed by the both of them, but rather Buggy. His crew made all the promo for the Cross Guild, putting Buggy at the center, even building a ship in his honor, and released this all to the world. This obviously pissed off Mihawk and Crocodile, but Mihawk only wants to live in peace, so he didn't mind the spotlight being on someone else, and said that they could easily dispose of Buggy at any point of need be, and Crocodile agreed. Well, he quickly would become an issue, delivering one of the best speeches in the story, declaring to the entire crew, which don't be fooled, are genuinely New World level, that they were all gonna go after the One Piece. I love this speech so much, but that's a topic for a different video. For now, it's really interesting to note how this will affect Crocodile. Here, he once again has the chance to go after his dream. He's still suppressing it, saying they're not playing pirates, but deep down, we know he wants it more than anything. Even still, in the moment he got really pissed off, mostly a buggy derailing his plans to make money and gain power and influence, but I think soon enough, we'll see another side to him. As he's dragged along by the crew to look for the One Piece, I can see him making new plans and strategies to one-up the other Emperor crews, theorizing on the man marked by flames and really getting into it. Surprising Mihawk, Buggy, and most of all himself. He'll get all Sundere saying he's just making the most out of Buggy screwing up his plans, but it'll light a fire and passion in him once more. Now, Crocodile's a villain. What he did at Alabasta led to countless innocent lives being lost and trauma that'll take generations to heal. And who knows what else he's done that we haven't even seen. So I don't necessarily want him to get a happy ending, but more so a satisfying one. I'm definitely on the boat that thinks Buggy's gonna find the One Piece for the memes, then Luffy will quickly snatch it away. But I think that would be enough. Crocodile laying his eyes on his ultimate dream would be enough for him. And I think then he'd be content. Maybe he'd be more like Mihawk after that. Just chilling, not causing problems to anyone, and maybe even spending his time running a legitimate business. I can really see that. After all is said and done to keep himself busy, Crocodile opens up like a legit bank. That would be really cool to see, but what do you guys think? Where do you want to see Crocodile go from here, and where do you want him to end up? Let me know. 
Also, if you made it this far, you'll probably want to subscribe to see another one or two of my videos in the future, and you can always change your mind. But yeah, thank you all so much for watching, and peace.